Buenas tardes. Soy Steven Levitsky. Soy director de... Good afternoon. I'm Steven Levitsky, director of the Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies in Harvard. I would like to welcome you to the fourth session of our academic forum for the new constitution in Chile. And today we're talking and why should you care about the convention's regulation? I have to tell you that we have simultaneous interpretation, English to Spanish to Spanish English. You just need to select the globe below in the lower point of your screens. As you know, the constitutional process in Chile is being followed with careful attention uh, all over the world on the case and the process, we think certainly that it could offer some lessons, not just for Chile, but also for other peoples and societies all over the world, and especially in my country, the United States. During all this constitutional process, this forum, we hope, will be helpful as a platform for an open debate and the high quality about a series of problems and dilemma faced by the Chilean while rethinking their constitution. The idea is to put together faculty members, political members, leaders of opinion, social people that could be Chilean and foreign to debate on different subject matters and different perspective, ideology, policy, theory. I won't forget to tell you that the fifth session will be on June the 16th, 9.30 a.m. And that will lead, will deal with the future of the economic model of Chile under this new constitution. And the main presentation is uh, Daniel Robert from uh, Harvard, an economist. I'd like to thank you uh, thank you, Dr. Klaas, and all the regional office, the regional office in Chile, is sponsoring this forum, and a special thanks for the director of that office in Santiago, Marcela Renteria, who created this forum. Thank you, Jimena Codina and Dana Barra, and I'd like to thank our consultative consultation committee, Veronica Figueroa, Claudio Puentes, Claudia Heiss. Juan Pablo Luna, Sandra Rodriguez, Sebastián Soto, and Manuel, also from Harvard Association of Chilean Students. And thank you, Luxich Scholars Foundation, for their support. And finally, I'd like to thank you, our great panel members that we will introduce in brief. Two or three little things. We will start with the presentation of Rosalind Dixon. After that, the colleague Sergio Verdugo and their work and comments will be commented by Gabriel Osorio and Javier Asensio. If you have questions, the chat is closed. But if you have questions for any panel member, send them through the Q&A function, preguntas y respuestas. Or you could wait until the end, and in the panel, you can send your question. The webinar is being recorded, and it will be in YouTube, Dr. Class site. The information or the link will be placed in the chat. At the end of this event, we invite you all to participate in a conversation that is a smaller and informal, if you want to stay with some of the panel members and members of the consultative team with your cameras open, you will have more information later on. Our moderator is Claudia Heiss, public affairs professor and head of the political science program in Universidad de Chile. She has been, um, amongst many other things, the chair of the Chilean Association of Political Sciences integrating the Technical Committee for the Constitutional Process in 2019. She's been researching and published uh, broadly about the change in the Constitution and the crisis of uh, democratic situation in Chile and other countries, the author of the wonderful book, Why Do We Need 
a new constitution. In Spanish, ¿por qué necesitamos una nueva constitución? Claudia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you for being with us tonight. I will briefly introduce so we have time for our great panelists. I think it is very important, uh, this uh, meeting about the regulation. You can think it's so technical regulation in the Constitutional Convention, and we have think tanks, we have academic teams and the Council for Transparency and the trade unions that are already thinking about this regulation, giving their opinion, as many think that rules and mechanisms to approve the norms and regulations and the mechanisms to participate in this are in regards to the regulation and have lots to do with uh, the uh, regulation. It's a pleasure to have Rosalind Dixon here, our main speaker, together with Sergio Verdugo, her Chilean connection, who together have been observing this process in Chile. Professor Dixon, she is a law professor in New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. So the time difference is really big. So we appreciate your being here uh, participating despite of that uh, difference. She's a co-chair of the Public Law International Society, ICON, and the PhD was in Harvard and visiting professor very recently. So it's kind of being back in home uh, with this Harvard organize, organized seminar. Then Professor Dixon will start as the keynote speaker together with Sergio Verdugo, the researcher of the law department in Universidad del Desarrollo and the adjunct uh, secretary general of the social society for public law. And we will have them first, and then we will have the comments on this presentation about the regulation. First, Gabriela Osorio, professor of administrative law in Universidad Nacional de Espejo and integrator, integrating the Constitutional Commission. We were together a key actor in the legislature work, and she knows so well how it works in Chile. And then Javier Asensio will uh, comment, a lawyer associated with Rumbo Colectivo, coordinator for the project of Rumbo Colectivo regulation, and now is the legislative coordinator of Revolución Democrática uh, chamber members. So now Rosalind Dixon will talk to you for a 20 minute presentation, approximately 20 minute presentation. Thank you so much, Professor Hyde, for that kind introduction, and thank you all for the opportunity to join you. <clears throat> I uh, am so grateful for uh, the opportunities the pandemic has brought for us to gather virtually in this amazingly triangular way. Here I am in Sydney, interested in developments in Chile, in my semi-home uh, academically of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we're bringing all three of those uh, connections together. Of course, COVID has also brought great uh, tragedy for Latin America, uh, and I'm thinking of our colleagues and friends there, as well as in India right now, which is really suffering. Um, it's my great pleasure to do this talk with Sergio, who is uh, someone who I work incredibly closely with in the International Society of Public Law, and who has really helped me understand the context and challenges in Chile, as well as the opportunities. He and I have a recent piece about social rights, which you may be interested in, and we are happy to share in the chat. Sergio, perhaps you'll do that if it's available already. And um, to have the benefit of Javiera and Gabrielle's comments and engagement, it's a, just a wonderful opportunity. And I'm very grateful to all of those who made it possible, Marcella, Deneb, Claudia, and Stephen, and the Rockefeller Center. So as Claudia says, you know, rules or reglamento sound uh, fairly dry but they're fundamental to any kind of democratic process. Kenneth Arrow, who, uh, if you are you know, a scholar, he, he should intimidate us all because he came up with a Nobel Prize winning insight in his mid twenties. And his insight was called Arrow's impossibility theorem, which is that there is no there there in democracy, that because of our divergent preferences and the nature of how we aggregate preferences, there's no social welfare function that satisfies minimum criteria of principledness. And what that amounts to is that procedural rules have a major impact on outcomes, that how we frame choices, who votes first, 
how we control the agenda can have a significant impact on how our choices are formed. And Arrow's insight has been refined and clarified, but no one has ever been able to challenge the centrality of his insight, which is that procedure and framing and, if you like, agenda setting power is the fundamental power that shapes our social choices. And in Chile, it is particularly clear that procedure and you know, rules of this kind are going to matter because of the way in which the process has been designed. There are a range of divergent uh, aspirations and viewpoints coming into this historic constitution making process. And the two thirds rule that has been stipulated for the adoption of a new constitution means that agreement is critical and how agreement is structured uh, and produced will largely depend on the rules that are set for deliberations uh, in any convention or assembly. So Arrow tells us that procedure is uh, fundamental to social choice and the way in which the Chilean process has been designed amplifies the importance of that choice. So let me talk a little bit about how we're going to structure out our remarks. I'm going to talk first of all about rules regarding transparency and regarding participation in the constitution making process. And then I am going to turn over to Sergio to talk a little bit about uh, some work we are uh, undertaking on how the constitution might think about default rules in the event it cannot reach agreement on certain issues and the timing of choices around setting the rules for the convention and for the deliberations. And then I will offer a very brief concluding note. So on transparency, before we embark on a discussion of what the rules should look like, it is useful to pause and think about what the guiding principles should be in regard to design. As Steve said, when we think about Chile, we can both draw on the world and best practices of global constitution making and try and advance uh, constitution making in a democratic and inclusive way that offers lessons back uh, to the world. I did a wonderful uh, short podcast with uh, Paula uh, in preparation for today. And she said to me, why is a Sydney-based uh, constitutional scholar interested in constitution making in Chile? And I would say, of course, why not? It's a historic and important moment. Uh, it is a pleasure for someone who knows Chile and visited and, and engaged with colleagues there to being involved. But there is a broader point I want to underline, which is that the globe is facing many, many uh, instances of what we call democratic backsliding, the kinds of trends that Steve and his co-author uh, have written about in ways that should give us great pause and make us very somber about the prospects for democracy worldwide. But Chile offers a, a, a much more positive, optimistic possibility for democracy. Uh, we have a moment where voters have overwhelmingly said they want to renew democracy in Chile and see a more inclusive, transformative form of constitutional democracy. But they are reaffirming their commitment to democracy in ways that mean that all of us around the world who care about constitutional democracy and work on its design and implementation should be both encouraged and inspired to contribute to the success of your process. Uh, so I am interested both as a, uh, a frequent visitor and interlocutor of Chilean uh, colleagues, but also as a global constitutional scholar who sees this as a moment that matters not just a great deal for Chile and its future, but for the hope that we have for democratic renewal around the world. So what should the guiding principles be? Clearly, there is a commitment in Chile to democratic transformation. The, the word transformative constitutionalism has now become a part of the global discourse or zeitgeist. And what it means is a commitment to reshaping a society socially, politically and economically using the constitution as a guidepost, a nudge and a structural empowerment uh, mechanism to promote social, economic and political uh, transformation. Clearly, Chile has aspirations for transformation, and those aspirations must guide the process of constitution making uh, as it unfolds in the next couple of years. But there are also commitments to preservation. Chile is a very successful economy, society and democracy. 
There are many, particularly on the right, who really want to see the preservation of what is the best of Chile's successes and traditions thus far. Clearly, that does not include uh, the Pinochet era and the history of authoritarian rule and abuse that went along with it. But the degree of social and economic stability and cohesion and success that Chile has achieved post Pinochet is something to be proud of and which many people on the conservative side want to see preserved. So the aspirations for the constitution must include substantial, meaningful and wide ranging transformation, but also a willingness to acknowledge an important commitment, at least among many of those involved, to democratic preservation. And therefore, a third principle that must guide the process in my argument is a principle of principled compromise. Now, in some ways, that is an oxymoron, right? To compromise is to give up on our ideals. But I think it is extremely important to underscore the role that principled compromise, holding on to our ideals, but finding an accommodation with those that we disagree with, can play in achieving democratic uh, responsiveness, legislation and constitutional change. Many of you will have read uh, Steve's book with uh, Ziblad on how we are, are endangering constitutional democracy by failing to respect norms of restraint. And compromise is in many ways a part of a norm of restraint. It says that we do not insist in every instance of pursuing our own ideals to the maximum extent we are willing to achieve them partially, imperfectly and incrementally. And one of the things I think President Biden is really uh, important for the world is in not only restoring democracy in the world's most long-standing and significant democracy, but reaffirming that centrism and compromise is not a dirty word, providing that it is not equivalent to a kind of status quoism that refuses to see the imperative for transformation. And one of the things I think we see in the new Biden administration is a very positive and powerful example of what includes inclusion and compromise can look like that is not simply reactionary and status quo oriented. Some of the most important personnel in the new Biden administration are radical transformative actors from the uh, Sanders and Warren campaigns. And I would really like to encourage the Chileans listening and participating in the constitution making process in Chile to think about the possibility of principled compromise, not status quoism or uh, a defeat for principle and aspiration, but a willingness to achieve that incrementally and imperfectly as part of a long term project of change. So what does that mean for transparency? There is very well known and important work by the political scientist Jan Elster that many of you may be aware of that draws on the experiences of the French Revolution and onwards and charts the role of confidentiality and publicity in constitution making around the world and throughout history. And one of the things that Elster shows is that confidentiality or non transparency is crucial in various instances to principled compromise. If we must perform all of politics in public, in the glare of the spotlight of public attention, it is very difficult to engage in the kind of frank and experimental conversations that can lead to principled compromise. And so we are living in a moment, rightly, of transparency, of WikiLeaks, of a citizen's demand to own our government and hold it accountable. That is absolutely appropriate in my view and we are seeking democratic transformation. But if we are ever to achieve principled compromise, we have to leave space for the kind of informal, dialogic, experimentalist conversation that can ultimately produce compromise. And that means some real degree of non-transparency in the process of constitutional negotiation. The glare of transparency must be applied at critical junctures in terms of the product of negotiations. People must be willing in the, in the spirit of rules to explain and justify their choices and votes. We must see the text and the product of deliberation and have people be willing to justify that publicly. But I would strongly urge Chileans to consider a mix of publicity and confidentiality in the design of the convention rules. 
My understanding from Sergio is that some people would like to see transparency all the way down, to like to see the convention deliberate in places like theatres in order to promote a truly transparent and inclusive spirit. And I commend where that instinct comes from. It's participatory, it's transformative, it's democratic. But in my view, it is a mistake because it does not give enough space for a process that involves multi-stage deliberation at which some of those stages must be in confidence to allow for the kind of informal dialogic experimentalist process that I suggest is a necessary part of principled compromise and the realization of some kind of reconciliation between democratic transformative aspirations and preservative commitments. The second kind of commitment that we want to think about is a commitment to participation. And global best practice in constitution making tells us that participatory constitution making is highly desirable. Indeed, it is arguably an evolving requirement of any legitimate constitution making process. It is very important from a democratic perspective, but also from the perspective of public confidence. People feel more committed to constitutions and their legitimacy where they have played a role in their creation and drafting. But I do think it is very important, once again, to recognise the importance of participation without insisting that a process should be participatory at every stage and all the way down. I think participation is critical, but again, I want to argue for a staged approach to participation, which sees participation playing a key role at various moments, not throughout the process and at every stage. So what can participation look like? One important model of participation is the plebiscite or the referendum, and that can occur before, uh, as we've seen in Chile, the, the empowerment of a process of change. It can occur after the fact in ways contemplated by the Chilean process, but it could also occur at various stages along the way. A second form of participation is election, the election of those who are going to be charged with drafting a constitution. Sometimes that is indirect in terms of the election of a parliament that then sits as a constituent assembly. And sometimes it's direct, as in the Chilean case of an election of an assembly directly to draft a new constitution. The third mode of uh, consultation or participation is really a form of citizen assembly that is getting the input of smaller groups of citizens in a deliberative fashion about specific ideas within a constitution. And then there is a model which is a more informal variant of that, which is widespread town hall style consultation, where citizens are offered the opportunity to comment on a draft and give submissions to a constitution making body. My suggestion is that all of these should be on the table as part of the mix in Chile, but that the critical word is mix. Some proposals recently, as I understand it, suggest that we should have a form of plebiscitary uh, constitution making that not only is about empowering the process and ratifying the product, but seeks to resolve all difficult questions along the way through a sort of plebiscite that breaks the deadlock in the assembly. I can see the appeal of that both as a way of insisting on transformation and as deadlock breaking. But I think it is a mistake. It is a mistake because it ignores the role of deliberation and principled compromise. It's a mistake because it produces a kind of populist democratic spirit that will infuse uh, Chilean politics in the future, largely to the detriment of a form of uh, government that is inclusive, stable and transformative in the medium term. Iceland and Brazil are some of the leading recent examples of constitutions that have sought to be radically plebiscitary or participatory in terms of the drafting in that mode. And I do not think they are widely seen as the most successful in terms of delivering stable but also transformative government. 
On the other hand, South Africa and countries that have followed it, like Kenya and Tunisia, that have tried to draft a constitution and then engage citizens in thoroughgoing consultation, submissions, town halls, radio broadcasts, and an open two-way conversation have been more stable and transformative at the same time. So my suggestion is that the Chilean process needs to reaffirm a commitment to participation, but in a mediated rather than plebiscitary way. The plebiscite has authorised the constitution making process and it will play a critical role in its conclusion by determining whether at the end the constitution is ratified by the people. There is also very important democratic principles governing the election of those who will draft the constitution. But once that is uh, factored in, given how thoroughly democratic that is, I think the best way of engaging the public is through small scale citizen assemblies and town hall meetings and submissions that allow for comment on draft articles, not on a kind of drafting by committee where the committee is the whole nation. And the reason for that goes back to Arrow. There is no principled social choice that can be yielded by simply putting together an unstructured conversation amongst millions of people. We need rules and we need mediation by elites through a process of reasoned deliberation, compromise, experimentalism and dialogue. And that must not amount to a status quoism that refuses to undertake the challenge of transformation, but that takes seriously the need to find common ground and to find ways of achieving divergent aspirations in language that is meaningful, coherent, and can really achieve the aims that it promises. Before I turn to Sergio, I want to just make one point about what I think is the danger of the plebiscitary constitutional model in the medium term. One of these, uh, this sort of issue came up in South Africa in 1992-93, and I think it's important to bear in mind. To some extent, constitutions can deliver on the promise of social and economic transformation. They can nudge it, they can empower it, and they can create a kind of politics that makes it more likely. But constitutions themselves do not lower metro ticket prices or make social security more sustainable. They simply encourage democratic elected officials and institutions to make those promises real. And a plebiscitary constitutional politics is in danger of allowing people to project onto the constitution all of their aspirations for social, economic and political change in ways that are surely unrealistic and likely to lead to medium term disappointment. It's really important that the constitution be an actual agent for transformation that reaffirms the faith of Chileans in democracy rather than a false hope and a false promise of, of total and utter uh, transformation of every aspect of social and economic life that necessarily must disappoint and therefore increase cynicism, disillusionment and de democratic distrust rather than faith. So I'll offer a final word on what compromise might look like if things are very difficult in the assembly, but on a more optimistic note, let me turn over to Sergio and if you're listening to simultaneous translation you might want to switch it around because I think Sergio is going to speak uh, in Spanish about what we might think of the default rules being and also the timing of some of these decisions. Muchas gracias, Ross. Tengo mis apuntes en inglés, así que si no les Thank you, Ross. My um, outline is in English, so I will go into English instead of speaking Spanish directly. The convention faces a very big challenge uh, regarding the democratic costs that a functioning uh, political system uh, usually reduces. We don't have a functioning political system functioning well today. So these costs are not really reduced, right? So the voters information are high, the information costs for state institutions uh, revealing what is acceptable are also high, the ally prediction costs are also high. Uh, and if we see how the convention is composed and the candidates that are running for the convention, we can see that these costs are predictable. We can predict them to remain high at, at, at least at the beginning of the, of the convention. 
So we know that the, that the types of representation that this convention can achieve are mostly the symbolic and descriptive types, right? Because of the reserved seats for indigenous peoples and for gender parity, uh, and because of the way this is distributed in, in the country as well, but not necessarily the representation um, based in interest-based representation will work well. This is the type of representation that is probably lacking and in which the, uh, the, the cost will remain high. So now we have, for 155 members that need to be elected, we have around uh, 1,300 candidates organized in around 79 lists, plus independent candidates for 28 districts. Most districts have around seven and nine lists. Many districts have more than 100 candidates. Many of the lists use names and titles that are not easy to connect with specific ideological content. Many lists use the word independent in their titles. Uh, many candidates also belong to lists that are running on a single issue platform, such as ecological platforms or energetic or whatever, like regionalist interest, even Christian interest or nationalistic approaches in some cases. Um, and in addition to that, voters need to decide on other non-related officers that are running. So there are uh, more than 14,000 uh, candidates for local councils, uh, 1,400 around uh, candidates running to become mayors, and then we have the candidates running for regional governors. So we can expect the um, this cost to, to remain high. Uh, and this will secure also a, a fragmentation in, in within the convention. Um, the information costs and the allied prediction costs will be very high. And in addition to this, if the Chileans see the Constitutional Convention as a conflicting institution that reproduces the problems that Chileans see in regular politicians, it is very likely that we, they will also distrust it and the convention le legitimacy will be undermined as a, res as a result. For these reasons, it makes sense to think that the three electoral processes that the constitution making procedure considers, the two plebiscites and the, and the election of the members, won't be sufficient right, to boost the constitution's social acceptance. So transparency and participatory mechanism can be helpful for that to counteract these problems as, as Ross already presented. But there is probably not sufficient time to plan for ambitious participatory mechanisms. And if these mechanisms are not well designed, they can endanger the conditions to secure multi-partisan agreements. So there is a trade-off between securing the conditions for successful multi-partisan agreements, which requires bargaining, uh, prescriptions associated with consensus building incentives and so on, and the need to open the process sufficiently though, so that Chileans don't feel that the convention is another purely elite-driven mechanism that doesn't differ from the current institutions. And this is the big challenge uh, and that, we need, that we need to address. And this is why we need to discuss these mechanisms uh, with, with, a lot of, with a lot of detail. Um, so the mechanisms need to address, uh, to reduce the transaction costs and stimulate collaboration while building trust. Uh, they need to uh, work within the rules that are incorporated in the current uh, constitution so that that trust cannot, should not be undermined from the beginning. Uh, one way to do this will be to agree on using default rules. So some people like Arturo Fontaine, for example, have proposed using the 1925 constitution uh, as a way to uh, start the bargaining process. This could be, I'm not sure if this is gonna be politically feasible, but it could be, uh, if feasible, it could be a successful way to approach it. Another idea that has been around is to use the Bachelet's proposal on a new, on a new constitution, although that idea seems to be less uh, feasible. Another idea that can reduce transaction costs is to start the process along with the approval of the, of the rules of procedure uh, with the approval of uh, an agreement on the uh, main principles of the content of the new constitution. Uh, here there are different models. Uh, the South African model, which is the most famous one, is not feasible to be used in Chile because um, the, the current rules prevent a constitutional court to review the content on the basis of previously agreed principles. But it is possible to design a system within the convention to review these principles uh, during the negotiations, perhaps with a multipartisan committee uh, of, uh, composed by elected uh, convention members to perform uh, these uh, tasks. Uh, also, it is very important 
uh, not to endorse the idea that it is, it is enough to approve only um, article by article for one time. Because if we have a, a procedure that only involves one time voting for each article or norm or chapter of the constitution, this will prevent from um, bargainings across themes within the content of the constitution to happen because it won't be sufficient to build trust among the different uh, sides of the, uh, of the bargaining table. So we need to think of a mechanism that can uh, produce trust, but perhaps a double voting system similar to what happened in Colombia could be useful for that. Also, it is very important to think of, a, of an agenda setting mechanism that can uh, help to produce trust. So for example, the Colombians, they had three presidents setting the agenda. The presidents represented three different uh, factions within the convention. In Chile, that's not possible because the, the, uh, the, the president will be only one and will be elected by absolute majority rule. But we could think about another multipartisan uh, way to uh, make the ascent to set the agenda. This is very, important, especially if we're going to have negotiations across chapters and across um, items within the uh, Constitution. So it's very important also that this, um, that the main institutions within the convention, uh, let's say the Mesa Directiva, for example, the, this other committee, are not uh, only working with a simple majority rule, not because simple majority rule is, is illegitimate, but because it could be a bad choice as a matter of design. Uh, for designing the committee's composition, if we're expecting those uh, committees to achieve certain um, uh, certain bipartisan agreements, we need to have the main factions represented there. And we need to think of a, of a, of a way to achieve a, a rule of sufficient consensus. So the committees are the place to build the consensus before the plenary votes with the two-third rule, uh, and not uh, just proposing things uh, by simple majority that will then be rejected in the plenary, right? That, that's, that's, the, that's, the, the, that's the worst that can happen. And we can think, we should think of a sufficient consensus rule uh, taking into consideration consideration how the factions will be organized within the convention, right? And the parties need to um, uh, measure their strength in the elections for that to happen first. But this, is, this may not be enough, so we still need to think about other gridlock solving mechanisms. Um, one thing that is very useful is to identify the themes that may produce gridlocks early so that they can be isolated and we can work on them uh, at the same time as we are producing agreements on other sides. We can think of a committee that will be uh, proposing solutions for the, these gridlocks and we need to design a procedure that allows this committee to be creative with these solutions. So one, possible solution is decide not to decide, right? To produce silence, postponing the decision in, in, the, in the way Rosalind uh, Ross and Tom Ginsburg have elaborated in their, in their paper. And our way is to uh, decide on um, drafting open textured uh, provisions that can make people that think differently agree on a language. And another way to do this uh, is to decide on a transaction. So for example, the right-wing coalition may decide to um, may bargain in favor of establishing the main clauses of the central bank and the left wing uh, can, uh, for, for example, bargain for establishing certain rules about human rights or the Human Rights Institute, for example. If we don't allow bargaining across themes, these solutions won't uh, happen. That's why it's very important not to have a one-time voting per issue without revising this in the end. So we need to allow this uh, cross bargaining, ac uh, bargaining across, across subjects. Uh, so so I, I'm, I'm going to leave it here. I have spoken too much until now. We can discuss all the details uh, after, after if, if you want. Thank you very much. I, Thank I, you. I think the, I'm sorry. The, the final thing I, I want to say is that I think it's important to recognize that for both sides, there will be difficulty reaching accommodation and compromise. And so figuring out any default rules that people can agree on from the outset will both motivate uh, you know, both sides to find common ground, but also create uh, a possibility of change and reform, even uh, in the face of disagreement about key issues. A and the last thing I want to say is about change versus symbolism, which is, it's possible, and this would be in, in some ways a disappointing result, but it's still better than no result. It is possible that there could be some major reforms uh, that are agreed upon, uh, at the two thirds level, but not a whole constitution. At which point one possibility that I want to add to the mix of defaults 
is that the assembly could readopt the existing constitution with three or four major reforms or amendments. And that would be a disappointment from the perspective of transformation. But if those changes or reforms were significant, it's important to note that the power of the people to reaffirm their constituent power and to shed the Pinochet era overlay is still important. Now, I can see Claudia expressing her disappointment of that possibility. I don't think it will get to that. And I have huge optimism that the constitution will be more transformative and revolutionary. But I think it is important to start with the idea that any amount of social transformation is progress and must be worked for, and that the perfect should not be the enemy of the good when it comes to achieving a more inclusive, egalitarian and democratic form of constitutional politics in Chile. But maybe that is the Australian in me, and if I was on the ground, I would be insisting on a more uh, revolutionary possibility. So we are going to turn over to our commentators now, I think, uh, Claudia, to hear their thoughts and tell us why we are wrong. Muy bien, dure la tarea que tienen Gabriel y Javiera. Eh, varias de las cosas que se han dicho aquí han, han It estado... is a hard job um, that um, we will have. This is a um, polemic position. It will be very interesting to see the reactions. We will start with Gabriel Osorio. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank you for the invitation and um, making a pause. And in my opinion, um, today on the convention, and also that should be dictated and it will constitute a procedure, a procedure and it is a convention and the agreements. However, I should not leave aside the fact that the pro constituent process is not a process that should have start or should start from the um, political elite, but it is product of a major political crisis, a major political crisis, and also the legitimacy uh, of the exercise of the legitimacy of the constitution. I um, uh, teach electoral right, I like elections, um, and um, these subjects, I was preparing a class and I found a law from 1930 in the, in the midst of the crisis of legitimacy between 1925 until uh, more or less uh, 1950 in representation. And uh, there was a law, 4,763, that authorized representation of, of um, candidates from political parties, um, cooperations, associations, independent candidates, and that was finished in 1958 when the monopoly of representation was given to the political parties. And that could be a starting point to talk about, well, this is an alert of the current political crisis in Chile. And the second reform with the agreement of November 15 and the establishment of parity, indigenous people and the improvement of representation. Why is that? Well, in the um, uh, guideline and what Professor Dixon presented, we have to understand the constituent process. It is a crisis, a crisis that um, has no background in 2019 or 2006. If we see 1997, we see the first, the first um, light shed on, on, on a crisis, a political crisis in that election. Back then, Chileans start losing trust in the political uh, system in Chile. Um, this is seen with the way the political transition in 1989 through constitutional reforms was understood and extended in time and it existed. There are 
many reforms or agreements where the citizens did not form part of or did not feel part of. And political participation came down except for the private side in 2020. So what is uh, what are people complaining about? Well, representative democracy, 1989, 2018 is over. It's definitely over and um, uh, it's not enough. It's not sufficient representative democracy so as to solve the political crisis in Chile. And that is why the citizens see with suspicion, and I was part of the November 15, and where Chileans see with suspicion uh, that all the same, uh, the same as always, they're simply dealing with the new text, uh, the new constitutional text. So there are issues on legitimacy as participation of the indigenous people, independence and inclusion. Having said this, once we have the uh, election chosen and in the plebiscite, the entry plebiscite and then the members of the uh, commission, constituent commission, and then um, even though I agree with the fact that it's a model that should avoid populist trends in the convention, we should not uh, take out the fact that there's, there is a crisis on legitimacy. And that cannot be solved today simply based, and this is my opinion, simply based on dark uh, some specific elements and that we need to compromise so as to reach an agreement. The agreement on November 15 that was very difficult in constitutional reform was transparent. It was transparent. It was transmitted. It was open. But of course, there should have been conversations around, you know, the, the meeting room so as to reach agreement and um, they got to law 20,200. And why is that? I think that disgracefully, the legitimacy situation of political parties and representation in Chile might go against the possibility of having maybe negotiations or negotiations among parties. I think in, abstract, we could say, oh, okay, this is positive. It's not possible. It's not possible. It's a political system that is more than fragmented. It has always had a political system fragmented due to the proportional representation system since 1925 on proportional system with the parentheses of the binomial system. But at the same time, that political fragmentation represents um, a representation and those that are going to be elected in the commission or to the commission rather, um, that will be the form or the way social policy will be represented in Chile. If we, that we receive criticism of having a next list or so many thousands of uh, candidates and um, many, um, a, a very long list. And if we have a, 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 like a, a bed sheet, a size of the, of a vote of so many people in the list. And there is great participation, but this is something that did not exist in our country. Uh, except for the 1930, 1958 period or 1920 um, with the electoral laws um, and that try to give solution to that. So that will allow for the person that will vote or the person that have an expectation and the process will be identified, feel identified with that. The problem of the political system in Chile is that the current system along with the constitution of 1980 will have no justification with Chile or the, with the people of Chile or has no uh, resonance with the people of Chile. If you hear 
a, a, an American, for instance, they say my constitution and they defend their rights based on their constitution. So just a few in Chile uh, or a minority that feel highly identified with the 1980 constitution and the political regime, which is over. And to give birth to a new political system, a new political system, a new constitution, a new constitution that will start up a new reform process. I agree with what it has been said that constitution is not like uh, blessed water that you're going to throw that water, it will solve all the issues. No, it will simply establish the base for conversation, for administrative law, right? for public and private relations, those bases, those um, uh, ground uh, bases uh, will be a necessary consensus and that will be representative or, or will represent all Chileans. That's why the article 133 of the current constitution that establishes the constituent proce procedure establishes the two third rules and that that rule should determine how, because what we need to avoid in Chile is a constitution of revenge, a constitution of um, constitution in Chile, because except for the small period between the 60s and um, 70s, the um, uh, reformed uh, constitution was only one social sector imposing its constitution on top of the other sector. And in 1933, the conservatives, 1925, and uh, talking about convention and, and rules, 1925, we had two subcommissions, one, the writing commission, and the other is the way the new constitution was going to be approved, a subcommission that never worked. And the writing commission, was presided by the president of Chile, President Alessandri. He, and uh, of course, the origin of 1980 constitution, which is the same. So in Chile, there should not be a constitution of one party or two, or, or just a revenge or, re, or um, reprisal um, constitution. It needs to allow negotiation, needs to allow agreements. But I, I am not, um against disagreement there will be disagreement and if there is no disagreement it will it, it will not be part and not all my expectations will be in constitution there needs to be disagreement if there's disagreement it will not be there in the constitution and this is something that we need to be clear about we cannot impose something and we cannot preserve or say, okay, 1980 could be a base text or 1925 could be a base text. No, we cannot keep something that is questioned today and is delegitimized from our modern view, from our, from our citizens view today. And um, that have felt a society that has felt excluded from decision-making, from public policy, and the great challenge is this has is to generate agreement elements, but not punishing disagreement, not punishing disagreement. And to finish, and sorry, um, Professor Hayes, I'm taking too much time, but I feel that a system on, based on commissions is important. And I'm not afraid of having approvals in those commissions with a simple majority. We used to demand, uh, ask for two thirds, but it could be uh, approved by a simple majority. And there are no problems to reach agreements with that. I think demanding a super quorum in commissions will make work more difficult, more than generating agreement. So I would like to reiterate, constitution is a fruit of a major political agreement but not each and every subject will be uh, solved and we shouldn't be afraid of non agreeing thank you professor gabriel osorio javiera asensio has her 10 minutes and uh, we will open up for a q a session 
Thank you very much, Claudia, for the invitation and presentation. Thank you to all the organizers of this event. First, I would like to apologize first. I am unlucky sometimes at a certain moment of this presentation. I had some trouble with the internet connection, so I might get lost in some of what you were saying. But I think that the debate generated is so interesting. First of all, I'd like to refer to the question you ask in this event. Why should you care about the convention's regulation or rule so as to be in charge of some of the things that we have said? And the most obvious and maybe the most important covered is that the Constitutional Convention fulfills what is expected from it that is complete for the citizens and if it is bad it will be an obstacle for them but i think that we should be careful about the challenge of the quality of the democracy implied in this constitutional process that is not just the convention design but the discussion constitutionally as they will be part of the future organizations of representation of power and I would like to disagree from Professor Dixon here in a point in regards to today. It is not just reforms what we need or some reforms, but the origination of this constitutional process is motivated by people mobilizing, claiming out for a different way of power distribution and allocation and a different way to create communities. So I think the challenge is really, really big in that sense and it's good to highlight and i know we've done it but social i mean chilean constitution will have something that is unheard in the world like the peer the represent the peers their uh, reserved seats for uh, first nations started with the plebiscite and finishing with the plebiscite and this regulation or rule should consider that and translate this conquer in a design of a convention that allocates power according to it showing that it is possible to have representation through uh, deliberation of democracy and co building community with uh, broad social legitimacy. So I think we need to think of a regulation where parity and representation of First Nations in a constitutional organization are reflected in the steps of this convention and thinking about the regulation, recognizing the rights of the peoples and recognizing uh, the democratic deliberation and decision making together with these processes which is fundamental as professor verdugo said it's important to show that this is not co-opted by elites and it's not a new way of their appropriation or taking them but it's an organization that is uh, servicing the constitutional power and the people so it needs to be central as the popular participation i mean to bring out the elites from this discussion. So I think one of the guarantees should be transparency of the convention and it acts, the access to information, the recognition of it, accountability of representation, matters that should be regulated in this rule of the convention. And I have some points to make about what was said on the value of confidentiality and the constraints and the exceptions in the transparency matters. I think due to the process we are living with a crisis of legitimacy and that we live, it is not that much reasonable to establish this privilege of deliberation or some other limitations to really be justified by confidentiality in the convention. I think it's a challenge of their representation democracy that the representation themselves, they are able to be accountable and explain how they act to the, the ones they represent. No fearing that this deliberation includes seating positions and concessions. So in the social media, we don't have to be blurred by the cloud. These needs to be rebuilt in this constitutional process and then transparency is fundamental in regards to the design of the process 
in the convention itself. I think what Professor Verdugo said of including mechanisms that generate trust, the trust that requires to be done to get the agreement, that building of trust needs to be facing the citizens, listening to them and taking them into account and telling them how the decisions are made and their participation is incidental for these decision making. I think it is important the reivindication of the black page and listen more than keeping a reference text. The reference should be today deliberation that is outside of the convention, that is institutionalized through the convention. So we need to listen to the citizens. There are several uh, key calves that we could implement. So this constitutional process will start listening to the citizens through the model of the uh, um, Artland Forum to delimit the principles of citizens to see how they um, uh, create the process. But I think then in the solution of a controversial points inside, we need to give them the option to adopt agreement. I don't think that that happens if you increase the quorum inside of the convention itself. I think it is important that we have clearly that two thirds are exceptions, but it should be exemption, but it's the way in which the constitutional rules are going to be accepted. So it's not that exceptional, but when I talk about exceptions, is that the internal organ organs should be able to adopt their simple majorities. The role of the commissions should be more to systematize the discussion, to propose solutions, to put the discussion in order, but it is in full where you have the strength of the convention and the decisions are making made in these Full, so the two thirds inside of a commission is not applicable because you are restricting a group, a small group of constitutional participants in the most important thing that might be that these commissions systematize and introduce constitutional discussion to the plenary. So in, instead of two thirds to get the decision. This is not this uh, a lack of incentivizing the decision. I think that the minority or whoever feels they are the minority through this two thirds rule, they could affect the approval of these rules if they are one by one. So what I think is that a committee is fundamental to open spaces for negotiation and to resolve conflicts inside of the convention. And I am in coincidence with Gabriel. Do not fear that everything is in the constitution and eventually what we should be careful or concerned about is the formal consistency of the constitution. I mean, not to have apparent and severe uh, problems, but not if there are coincidences with the previous constitution that if they are not kept or let's say there's a system that in a democracy could be in charge of uh, situations like that. Okay, that for now, I think I thank you for the invitation. Well, this is there are so many mechanisms to solve our controversial points and we need to check the way in which we generate an internal organ inside of the convention with enough power in order to solve politically inside of the convention, always facing and including the citizens, any uh, situation that comes out of controversy and you give uh, the voice to 
to the people as well. Thank you very much, Javier. Thank you very much, Javier. Before we can open the questions to the public, we will give you Professor Dixon and Verdugo if you want to react to these reactions. Thank you so much, Claudio. I love the vision of the constitution that Javier and Gabriel uh, set out. I'm voting for it. <laughs> I think that the inspiration to have a really reimagined form of constitutional politics is very important and very welcome. And it is simply a matter of trying to think, as you have both done, what the two thirds rule at the end means for the possibilities of achieving this. And one of the things I think comes through in both of your remarks is the idea that we would have simple majority in different committees or commissions and then a vote at the end on the whole. And I think that is very appealing, but I do think it is important to be realistic about what it means, which is Tom Ginsburg and I talk in our piece about deferral, about different mechanisms. We say sometimes it is abstract language, sometimes it is a bylaw clause that explicitly empowers the Congress or the legislature, but sometimes it is by adopting specific but conflicting clauses. And what both of you are effectively proposing is the third model. We will have a proliferation of things adopted by simple majority that then are voted on as a whole, and they may not go together. Now, Javier says, do not fear inconsistency, and I agree with you, but it effectively gives the court a big role to play down the line in reconciling the conflict. And I think that if one is talking about a participatory constitution, a democratic constitution, there has been understandable concern in recent years about how much power the court should have in Chile. And without fundamentally reshaping the court, there is a real danger to simply punting disagreement down the line by saying we will have a wonderfully attractive constitution with many clauses included by way of simple majority that don't fit together very well, because effectively that means the court decides. So the starkest example would be that if you had a committee in charge of the property clause, a committee in charge of social rights, they both adopt their preferred model, they don't fit together very well, well, it will be the court who has to reconcile the provisions. So I think it is very appealing, the vision you articulate. And I think that I personally, I don't know if Sergio would agree that the model of a simple majority followed by a two thirds has a lot of logic to it. But I think one must be realistic that effectively it delegates a lot of power to courts and the courts have not earned a high degree of trust in recent years and therefore judicial reform needs to be part of the discussion and there has to be a realism about what that strategy involves which is empowering the judiciary to help mediate conflicts in the future. I also just want to redouble what I said about a mix of candor and confidentiality. No one is suggesting, and certainly I'm not suggesting, that people should not be transparent about the results they reach, why they reach them, and justify them to their supporters. Absolutely. As you said, uh, Gabrielle, that was part of the uh, procedure that was adopted for this constitutional process and must be a, a guiding principle. But there are some things that are very hard to say in public, which is, for instance, how much you want to empower the courts to play a role in enforcing social rights depends on who the court is. And as you know, Javier Cuso and others have said, you may not want to empower the current court so much, but a different court, yes, maybe. And you can say it at that level in public, but to go beyond that is to really question the independence of the judiciary in, in difficult ways. So no one is suggesting, certainly not Sergio or myself, that there should be confidentiality all the way down, not at all. There should be transparency of result and justification for the result from all sides. But that some of the things we may need to say in explaining why we have different preferences are better said without the glare of television at every moment. And so that transparency must be a guiding principle and value in the same way that participation is, but there can be still spaces for more informal politics off camera and in a more, uh, you know, sort of driven by recent experience of governmental actors and people who are very informed about how the process has worked. So I, I think our vision is much closer to yours than you think, which is this is a, a, an amazing moment. It's a revolutionary moment that has to be pursued to the fullest extent possible. And the Indigenous participation and the gender parity clauses are amazing. They're world leading. 
but one has to see the possibility for the two thirds clause to impose a break. And that if one solution to that is to, if you like, aggregate clauses adopted by simple majority that are in tension with each other, that is an acceptable way of doing things, but it does empower the judiciary down the line in ways that one has to be cognizant of and least design in ways that address. Um, quiero, quiero agradecer a, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Asensio and Osorio for these uh, really good comments. And there's one thing in which you both agree that we need the possibility of silence when there's disagreement. And I think that is a possibility that could become very helpful in some cases, but not in all of them when one more than one third of the convention would like a condition to be approved of this new constitution, a positive rule. So we need something for that to be possible. What uh, Rose as is proposing is the simple majority, the full text is approved with two thirds in that case the positive rules will have a good possibility of negotiation. But if you go article by article with two thirds, that negotiation is a lot more difficult and there's more incentives to boycott a process. Then we don't want to cre create that. So the technique of silence is helpful, but it's not the only possible or available technique. Getting to an agreement between parties of the constitution is essential, especially for the quality of the constitution that we want to have. There are things in the constitution that are basic, essential, defining a constitution. There was a Rumbo Colectivo proposition that says something very valuable about how can them identify the essentials of a constitution in regards to what we need more agreement. That's the direction where we need to go. But defining this, this needs to be taken on incentives to get to an agreement and not on the base of just the majorities, as again, they might not get two thirds. So the idea of commissions, if they could have simple majority, will depend on the rest of the conditions. The idea of sufficient consensus is to create consensus that could be gathered later on by the plenary. But if you have other conditions like the commission of agenda to define the agenda in multi parties and you have more than double voting in the plenary in regards to the project, then you can satisfy conditions. So you have transactions between the subject matter and the simple majority through commissions is making more sense. That's why this regulation plays a role that you cannot assess separately, but they play together a role. Professor Osorio said about the default rules. What happens if there's no agreements? Can we work with the default rules? Then we need to assess that the critique of Professor Osorio, we don't have default rules that are legitimate and the rules of 1925 constitution are not enough in legitimacy. The budgeted project would not be uh, sufficiently legitimate. So social legitimacy will depend on how the rules are communicated and depend on other things. And I won't take them ex ante as not legitimate. We have not had constitutions that are too participative, but it's not the only thing to explain the social participation in the end of the day. So maybe Professor Osorio is right, not having the feasibility of social acceptance, working with this sort of rules in that sense, talking about the ex ante principles declaration or with agreements that are helpful for ex ante process could be helpful, but it's not uh, something that we shouldn't think first. The logic is the convention needs to be designed to uh, stimulate as a stimuli for the consensus. If it is under the majorities, that will fail. If you have a board of directors by members that are uh, simple majority and the agenda is defined by simple majority and you vote once and uh, in uh, 
pieces and the simple majority that is not representing all the sides is voting in simple majority always, definitely you won't get two thirds. That is a poor system to uh, create a stimulus for cooperation. We need to do that. So, as Rosalind said, the rules like confidentiality are really exceptional. Transparency is important to guarantee representation. So the citizens assess the work of the elected people, but confidentiality could be helpful to uh, bring out the blocks that uh, the blocking of the convention that could be helpful for the opposition to find the boundaries of the others. If they're not able to get these boundaries, then they are not able to identify the common space that they have for agreement. If they're not able to do that, then the two thirds are not reachable. Well, thank you. We have several questions. Professor Dixon was already answering through the chat. Thank you for that. And uh, we will uh, anyway, uh, talk about that. It's clear enough that the privacy space for negotiation is uh, very polemic. I think it is not just uh, the political negotiation and the privacy space for negotiation mentioned in Professor Dixon's and Professor Verdugo's presentations, but also the particular experience of Chile and the political viability of defending a rule like that in the Chilean current context. So when the process becomes the result of rejection is a way of creating the policy that has been interpreted like a kitchen, it is hard to defend a rule to establish uh, the spaces of uh, opacity or lack of transparency where we have uh, the subject of demanding of participation in the constitutional process despite of two uh, direct democracies and the representative democracies they see it as not sufficient as we have an unheard of uh, distrust starting by 155 people that are conventional will not exhaust the concept of representation. There won't be for this representation. We're looking for an innovative way to understand the representation in the crisis of political representation at a world level, but very specific in Chile because of the transition and institutions that took us to this moment. I will read some of the questions of the public, despite of the fact that uh, the professors answered, but Gonzalo Vasigalupo was asking about transparency and Professor Dixon saying this is attractive in the way they are presented, but it has been so rejected. I do the same and as it is the source of distrust, and that could be more relevant so the citizens buy it out as a new constitution. And Professor Dixon answered. And Chloe, let me just say live, I think that transparency does require justification. I mean, and I think the way Gabriel framed it was very powerful, which is if you reach a compromise and you are an advocate for a, a provision, you must go back to your supporters and explain and justify. And I do think it is one reason that in selecting people for the convention, it would be desirable to have a mix of truly independent citizens without a lot of elite experience and leaders of trade unions and social movements who have some recognizable base to whom they can then go back and have a conversation. Because I think our role, if we are charged with the privilege of drafting, is to reach the best transform you know, formative constitution we can, but then to explain to those who put us there what we tried to achieve and what was realistic. And justification after the fact has to be very extensive to meet 
a kind of transparency requirement. And so I do think it's important that when we talk about enclaves of informal negotiation, we understand that they are backed up with a strong public justification requirement after the fact. But if we don't trust the people telling us what they did, there's a big problem. But I am more hopeful because I think that the people who will be elected to this process are not the elites in whom people have lost trust. It will be people like Gabriel and Javiera, and there will be people in the room who are uh, willing, uh, we have enough trust in to trust their justification. Ok, muchas gracias. Vamos a ver quiénes son las personas que van a estar en la convención, porque... Thank you very much. Let's see who are the conventional. There will be some non-traditional politicians, but there will be some. There will be a different uh, one of the typical, but with an important component, as we are part of a process that is following the election rules that are designed basically for the political parties. Another question in the chat it was about cultural difficulties to bring a theoretical constitution model into a reality. Saying that it's difficult and maybe it's a mistake to blame participation in the constitution because of instability in Brazil. Consequently, there's no possibilities to learn from that, but in Chile, it will be crucial to have a challenge of cheating political culture that we have in the elite, that is to cheat the political culture in the elite. And we risk an, uh, a new uh, decoration ornament for the constitutional law that will fail in solving the uh, plutocracy and resolving the problem of the political inclusion of the marginalized classes. So the success of the convention should not consider the whether and the how this procedure could produce sociological legitimacy if we take into consideration the problem of political culture. João Victor Cardoso asked Professor Nixon. This is like a PhD thesis question, come on, but it's but very it also, important. It's deeply important. Well, and it yes. It, <laughs> it picks up your point as well, Claudia, about um, participation and trust. So I just want to stress, I think perhaps you are right to call me out on being too quick to dismiss Brazil. Uh, and there are more positive lessons. But I think we should be looking for innovations in Chile around public participation, not a purely plebiscitary model. And one of the innovations that people have come up with in recent years is the citizen mini assembly, so that we could have hundreds of deliberative assemblies around the country where each committee or commission goes out and says, right, we have a clause, a social rights clause, and we are going to now spend a hundred days going around the country involving groups of 20, 30 citizens in deliberating about options. And I think that is a more desirable approach than just simply putting it back to the country as a whole, because the country as a whole will speak at the end of the process. And so I think a multi-stage participatory model that involves plebiscitary, you know, mass voting, which is compulsory and inclusive with a more deliberative focused approach, which can explain why the options are on the table, what they would involve, and then put it to people. You know, one of the models I think is really powerful, that has really guided my thinking on this, is a process that has been pursued in Australia in the last two years by Indigenous people trying to achieve major constitutional reform nationally. They have had a series of dialogues around the country in every major language group and every major community, which is, you know, many, many in Australia, like there are 400 languages and they group them into, you know, very significant uh, dialogue groups to formulate proposals that went to a national group. And that kind of deliberative process where options were put on the table, it was a candid discussion about pros and cons, and there was then more consensus coming out was very powerful. So I think, Claudia, when you say it can't be just representative democracy, Gabrielle said that as well, I agree completely. 
but I think a mix of deliberation and voting and real consultation, which says to people, these are the options, this is what they mean. You know, constitutions inspire great interest from us. We love it, but ordinary people want to see results. And I think it's just really important. I, I'm mindful we are running out of time, but in answer to the concern that, um, you know, Dr. Cardoso raises is this, which is people want to see a, a move that is significant away from the current neoliberal economic political model, right? We want a different model of healthcare, a different model of social security and pensions, and a difference in views about public transport and public infrastructure. And that requires pretty careful grappling with how to preserve the best of Chile's prosperity and transform it in a way that is constitutionally meaningful. And simply putting one's aspirations in without getting that right is just going to lead to disappointment down the line. That, you know, the, the, the kind of vision that Javiera points to a new form of community, it's a wonderful inspiration and it's one I share, but it is a mix of politics and constitutional law and the two have to go together. And I think putting all of our aspirations into the process itself, right? The process has to be trustworthy, but so do the results have to be meaningful. They have to actually set up the country for success when it comes to reform of healthcare and pensions and public infrastructure and transport and education. It's no point having a wonderful process that doesn't deliver on that ideal. And so I think explaining to the public, these are our options, this is what we're fighting about, these are the stakes is important, which is why I would like to see radical new models of participation that will teach the world, but which take seriously the mix of mass participation and scale town hall style, consultative assemblies around the country, engaging with committees and the assembly as a whole as part of a truly meaningful participatory process that leads to real change in the socioeconomic vision um, that the, the constitution delivers on. You know, one of the things I made a joke, I gave a, a very uh, enjoyable lecture last year, the Hunayas lecture, and I always joke, I was trained at the University of Chicago, but I am not a neoliberal. I am a person who believes in a much more social liberal model. And, you know, I have work that is coming out this year with Richard Holden, an economist in Sydney called a fair markets approach. I think Chile needs to move first and foremost to a constitution that guarantees social liberalism or democratic liberalism, not neoliberalism, and adopts what I call the vision of the Chicago girls, not the Chicago boys. But I think it is important to be real about what constitutions and participation can deliver, which is in moving away from neoliberalism and the Chicago boys, one has to preserve prosperity and create real change and not project onto the constitution the idea that it can deliver that change without the supporting structures and politics. And so getting the structures right really matters. And that is something which people can play an informed role in shaping and deciding, but they need to be told why these models work or don't work and how it is that the vision of moving past Pinochet and neoliberalism can be realized in practice. And there is a danger to reifying participation and the process over the results. And we must achieve a legitimate process, but also inform the citizenry about how to achieve the results that they really want. Bueno, muchas gracias. Thank El you. I would like to thank Rosalind Dixon, Sergio Verdugo, Javier Asensio, Gabriel Osorio. I needed to leave, uh, had another conference for this wonderful conversation. And from for uh, every one of you, Marcela will make an um, invitation. Thank you so much for this important discussion in this forum. Um, constitutional process in Chile.